often one of the things that people say about Vedanta is that it's very abstruse and very sort of high philosophy and very abstract. It does have that component to it, but it also has a component where the principles that Vedanta talks about are directly applicable to right here and right now, our daily lives. Being a human being is not very easy. How do we know? Why is this the first topic that we are doing? Why are we talking about stress first? Because stress is so ubiquitous. What's killing us? Heart disease. Where does heart disease come from? Stress. Our relationships with other people. Normally okay, but the moment I get stressed because of my work, because of my health, because of my money situation, whatever it happens to be, I take that stress into my relationships with my wife, with my kids, with my friends, even though they've got nothing to do with it. So we need some method of managing stress, of dealing with stress, and hopefully eliminating it. And that's what the philosophy of Vedanta can provide, among other things. So let's get a little bit into what we mean by Vedanta. So, as I'm sure you're aware, Vedanta is this ancient philosophy of India. It presents the principles that underlie human experience. Why do you experience your world, your life, the way that you do? Why do you not experience it a different way? What are the principles that underlie the quality of your experience? Aha, this is what Vedanta starts to talk about. We'll get into that in more detail as we go through. But just a little on this word Vedanta. So the word Vedanta comprises two other Sanskrit words, Veda, Anta, knowledge, end. So Vedanta then is the end of knowledge. Now this seems counterintuitive. This doesn't seem to make sense. Why not? There is no end. Anybody who's ever done a degree, the moment you start learning something, what do you suddenly recognize? There's a whole bunch more questions. There's a whole more branches of knowledges that I have no idea about. So the more we learn, in a sense, all we're doing is expanding our area of ignorance, in a sense. But here we're saying that knowledge does have an end. So what do we mean by this? Okay, let's briefly explain what we mean by knowledge having an end. What's this question at the bottom? What are you trying to achieve? There it is, happiness. It normally takes two, three minutes, so I get lots of other answers popping up left, right and centre. I'm glad you went straight to the point. The heart of the matter. Whatever you do, it's for happiness. So the example that our teacher gives, one man picks up a cigarette and smokes it. Why? Happiness. Another person quits smoking or gets away from cigarette smoke. Why? Happiness. One person marries a woman. Why? For happiness. He divorces the same lady 10 years later. Why? Happiness. Everything we're doing, whether it's a short-term goal, I want ice cream, or a long-term goal, I want a degree and a career and a family. The reason that we're doing it is because we envisage that by going through that exercise and achieving that goal, I will experience a superior well-being. I'll be happier, more satisfied, peaceful, whatever word you want to use. It's not just happiness, is it? Because when you get something, let's say you want a pay rise, you get your pay rise and there's that fluctuation of happiness, right? The moment you get the pay rise, there's the joy. What starts to happen over a period of time? It dissipates. It gradually diminishes. When you look at your first month's paycheck with the extra money, it's like, yes, you get a little kick. Yeah, right on. I can buy an extra pair of shoes or whatever it is. One month later, five months later, six months later, 12 months later when you look at your paycheck, do you get the same kick? Yeah, it's become normal to you. And so the satisfaction we got from the pay rise, it peaked and slowly went down. The same is true for any experience we have. And so when it peaks, we're happy. As it starts to degrade, what do we find we have to do again? We have to go into another activity to bring that sense of satisfaction back up again. And of course, it decays away. And so we go again and again and again and again. So it's not just happiness once not just happiness for a short period of time, we want permanent happiness all the way through. So what we're looking for, if we look at our own life, our own activities, is permanent 
unbroken satisfaction. Not too much to ask. All right, now if you knew how to get permanent unbroken satisfaction, what else do you need to know? Okay. How to maintain it? Well, it's permanent and unbroken, so it implies that you're already maintaining it. It is, of course, a trick question. Nothing. If you know how to be permanently, unbrokenly satisfied, you don't need to know anything else. You've got what you are looking for for every activity. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't learn new skills. Let's say you're a teacher and you have achieved permanent, unbroken satisfaction. That doesn't mean that you know that you're the best teacher in the world. You can still learn more about pedagogy. Or if you're an engineer and you've achieved permanent, unbroken satisfaction, you still have to maintain your knowledge of engineering. So you still learn lots of new things, ideas and skills, but as far as knowing how to make yourself happy in this world, you don't need to know anything else. You've achieved the culmination of human knowledge, Vedanta. So this is what Vedanta is getting us towards, greater and greater well-being, which is relevant to this topic, of course, because what we tend to experience is stress. So this is what we're talking about here. We want the knowledge that will bring us this permanent satisfaction. How do we gain knowledge of anything? Study. Questioning. You want to gain knowledge of how cats function? What do you do? Observe your cat. Ask questions about your cat. When does she eat? When does she sleep? When does she fight? When does she mate? All these things you want to know about your cat, you question. Well, you want to know about your life? You want to know about how to make your life better? What do you have to do? Question your own life. So this is what we're doing here. So when we're talking about life then, life is a stream of experiences. Right, now you're having an experience, and of course that one's gone, now we're having the new one. And the new one, and the new one, and the new one. So this flow of experiences is your life, in the same way that when you look at a, an old, say, 9 millimeter film, when you will look at it on the screen, it looks like a seamless motion of activity. But you know it's not that. It's one square, then another square, then another square, then another square on that celluloid. As they rush past at dizzying speed, we get this movement. So too, experience after experience after experience moving through is life. So then, an experience, we need to understand what that is. An experience comprises two factors, subject and object. What is the subject? Exactly. I am the subject. The object is the external world. So when the individual, the subject, meets the world, the object, an experience is born. So right now, you are the individual, as you were always. Your world now is this room, my voice, the air conditioning, the lights, the sound, everything else, the thoughts you're entertaining, the emotions you're entertaining. This is your world. So when you, the individual, meets the, sub the object, the world, and experience is born, the flow of experiences is your life. What determines the quality of your experiences is not so much the external world, but rather the quality of the internal personality. So one of the examples we use to describe this, consider the 9-11 attacks. You could imagine one person watching those towers fall and in his heart is sorrow, sadness, anger, he's disgusted. You had another person watching from a different vantage point and his heart rises joy, satisfaction, happiness. Same external environment, completely diametrically opposed experiences. Why? What's different about these two individuals? Their mind. Exactly. The inner personality. So let's go back to that previous slide. The body performs an action, but it's only the mind and intellect that propel the action. So we need to understand this distinction between mind and intellect, and this will get clearer as we go through, because this session is mostly about the mind. The mind is the non-rational part of us. Feelings, emotions, likes and dislikes. The intellect is the part of us that proceeds via thinking. Uh, it's the capacity to think and reason without bias. 
These are the two elements of the personality that we need to sort of understand. So first of all, we understand that the nature of the mind determines the way we experience our world. It also determines the choices we make. The example we give here is a diabetic and a sweet. Let's say you know someone who's a diabetic and you hold a sweet out to that person. I don't know why you do this, but for some reason you do it. The person's standing there, stock still. He's not moving a muscle, but he loves sweets. So what's his mind doing? His mind is reaching out and saying, take it. What does his intellect do? Observation. So to, first of all, there's observation. That's a sweet. Then there's an analysis. A sweet has sugar. If we eat it, we get sick. Cause and effect. Conclusion, therefore, I should say no. If the mind is stronger than the intellect, what choice does he make? If the intellect is stronger than the mind, no thank you. No. What we need to understand is that we are all diabetics and the world is full of sweets. <laughs> Just around the corner is another sweet. Beware. What choice am I going to make and on what basis? Am I going to choose because I like it? Or am I going to choose because my intellect has recognized this is the right choice? So this is the distinction we need to understand, mind versus intellect. The main point that we want to recognize as far as this particular session goes is that it's an ungoverned mind that causes stress. What we tend to do is attribute stress to the external environment. So someone says to you, I'm so stressed out. Why? A deadline at work. My husband's nagging me constantly. The kids won't listen to me. I'm worried about my money situation, etc. We point at all of the external things and say that is the cause of my stress. What Vedanta is saying and what we're going to sort of try and get into more through this session is that the cause of stress is never external. There may be triggers that are external, but we need to distinguish between a trigger and a cause. I'll give a very simple example to illustrate this. I'm at a social event with my wife. And I see her talking to a handsome stranger on the other side of the room. And I start to get furiously jealous. That's my experience, my interpretation. And then I choose the action of running over there and busting into the conversation. Hi, I'm her husband. I'm Glenn. Nice to meet you. <laughs> my jealousy, what's the cause of it? Is the cause of my jealousy my wife speaking to another man? Of course not. I can't go to my wife and say, you are the cause of my jealousy. You're the cause of my stress. It's ridiculous. She would hopefully turn around to me and say, get out of here. Go introspect. The cause of my jealousy is my possessiveness over my wife. The cause of my stress is internal. I get in traffic and I'm upset, not because of the traffic, but because of my relationship to the traffic. This is what we're going to show a little bit more as we go through. So we need then to recognize that it's the ungoverned mind that causes stress. We cannot govern or control what we don't understand. So we must come to some sort of understanding of what the mind is if we're going to effectively manage it. All right, any questions on any, anything of that before we move on to the next section?